Good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, Lockdown 21 Photography Sessions. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a very cool week so far with some fantastic speakers. Uh, we had uh, Claire on yesterday, who was uh, our uh, fantastic food stylist. And um, today we've got a uh, fantastic food photographer. So um, now you've, you've learned how to style uh, your, your dishes so that they're Instagram ready. And, um, and Curtis is going to, uh, to take us through how to make those things uh, look super sexy uh, from a photography point of view. Um, yeah, so I, I'm just going to hand straight over to Curtis. He's amazing. Um, please feel free to ask your questions. Um, the whole way through, the more you ask, uh, the more he'll give. So, all right, Curtis, over to you. Awesome. How's it, guys? Cheers. Thanks, uh, thanks Quentin, for that. Um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Um, it's, it's actually uh, it's very cool to kind of be part of a group like this where you can speak to photographers of all level. Um, I saw some of the photographers commenting in the group who are photographers I look up to. So uh, it's a really uh, special platform for me to kind of share a little bit about what I do. Um, but yeah, in a nutshell, as I could have pointed out, I'm a food photographer. Um, I'm going to start off by just taking you through my, my journey as a food photographer. Um, the, I, I decided really early on that uh, food was something that was very important and special to me. So um, I actually moved up to Johannesburg. I uh, grew up in Durban and um, I was working in property. I did a big comp through NISA and had the whole corporate job and then ended up losing my job and um, figured, jeepers, what do I do now? Do I... Do I go back to Durban? Do I stay up in Johannesburg? And um, at the time, I'd started investigating photography. I went and bought a little Nikon D90 um, on credit because I was completely broke, and um, which is not a good thing to do. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, but yeah, I was fortunate enough to get a break. I started off assisting. And uh, the first point that um, I want to just quickly touch on is uh, when people are getting into photography and learning photography, there's obviously the two two different schools. You got the guys that went off and assisted, some guys went and studied, and um, I don't believe one is better than the other. Um, I think they both hold um, value in, in photography and um, in, the, in, in the workspace. I think they both have got different pros and cons to each, each one. Um, but I was quite fortunate that I, um, I assisted two photographers mainly. One was a predominantly a food photographer, and the other one was a, a lifestyle photographer. And um, the one I studied, the one I hadn't studied. So I got a nice mix of, um, of, of experience. And um, the, the reason why um, I got into food was, was because of the journey behind food. So from a lifestyle perspective, I could, if you had to think of an, a magazine editorial, you get given a, a brief to go shoot a factory that make cheese. Um, there's a lot of elements involved now. You get portraiture, you know, photographing cheese makers. You have a beautiful documentary kind of thing you can do with um, telling the story. And which is um, which is a bit more lifestyley sometimes with people, and so I think that um, there's a nice integration integration there. So I fell in love with food because of the story behind food, um, and because of the, the the food what it does in our in our, our circles and in, in our communities. I feel like food for me is a um, is a connector. So we love love to eat. Managing my weight is something that I continually struggle with um, being in this industry because it's not easy. I can tell you that. Um, so that's why I kind of got into food and, and I decided to specialize in food and tabletop uh, stuff. I'll, I'll, I'll take you through some of the stuff that I do. Um, but for me, it was a question and Claire touched on it yesterday about, you know, why I specialize um, and, and why be so, so niche. Um, for me, it was not that I didn't like other forms of photography. Um, I just really loved this one. Um, and I felt like I had... I connected with it and I felt like I could, I, I woke up every single morning and I could passionately get out of bed and go, I'm going to go photograph a hamburger today. Let's go and do it. Where a lot of guys I see, especially young assistants that come onto, onto sets and they want to, they, oh, food, that's this wonderful thing. 20 minutes into the shoot, they're falling asleep. They're like, oh, I want to go shoot people. I want to shoot fashion because nothing wrong with that. That's just where their heart, their heart is. Um, so by being passionate about food, you're keeping your finger on the pulse. You're looking at, what other guys are doing, but you're also maintaining a, an element of, um, you know, of understanding within your own craft. You're going, okay, other guys are doing that. It doesn't mean what I'm doing is bad. Um, you know, I think there's a, there's a very fine line in terms of copying and, and overcomplicating things. You know, everyone's got a journey that they take, especially in food. Um, and um, I think it's a journey that naturally, naturally evolves. Um, 
I'm a photographer and I also direct. Um, I've been directing food for about four years now, and I've been probably a food photographer for about six years now, uh, full time, um, which has been which has been a great journey. Um, so I'm going to take I'm going to touch on some of the the food directing um, that I've that I've done just just basically. But I feel like the things that I'm going to share from a stills perspective tra translate and cross over to the live action um, world quite um, effortlessly. And I think there is a very big similarity. Obviously with the, with, the, the, with the performance pieces, you've got more elements, you've got music, you've got, mo you've got movement within a frame. So there's a whole other um, conversation we could have along that. But I think that's what you, it, uh, a lot of good directors also that I look up to have previously been um, photographers. So they've learned um, the basics there and, and kind of crossed over. So what I do in a nutshell, um, I shoot food, I shoot drinks, products, pack shots, still life, tabletops, um, high speed photography, which we'll touch on a little bit later, and high speed food, which I'll show you in, in, the, uh, in the next slide. Um, high speed food, I'm, is that different to fast food? <laughs> slightly different. Um, <laughs> one makes you fat, one makes you stressed. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, they, they're very close. Um, and then I put portraiture there, I put an asterisk next to it because. Um, Part of the spin-off from being a food photographer is that you do get, you deal with people, you deal with chefs, you deal with um, artisans who make produce, you deal with farmers, you deal with um, people in the community that enjoy food. So there's, there's, there always will be a people element to food. Um, so I feel like if you are a really good people photographer um, getting into food, you've almost got a bit of a, a upper hand because there will always be a kind of an element of portraiture that, um, that you do. So I think let's, uh, let me start with a little bit of directing that I do. This is a behind the scenes shots on, uh, from a KFC TV commercial that I did. Um, fortunate on, this, on these kind of jobs, nice big budgets, um, really nice gear, and the client really invests heavily into getting good quality food imagery, which I think is very important. Uh, this was shot on, uh, on, on a Phantom. There's about three in the country, I, I believe. Um, it, it's a camera that allows you to shoot at a thousand frames a second, ideally for catching, um, capturing high speed food. So um, I'm going to show you a quick, uh, quick video here of that, um, oopsie, sorry, I'm going to show you a quick video of that behind the scenes. <laughs> the new masala crunch, an epic fusion of flavors you never saw coming, only at KFC, it's finger licking good. Yeah, so that was the, um, the, the live action from that behind the scenes that you saw. The great thing about this campaign is I was able to direct the TV as well as plan and conceptualize the stills with the creatives. So uh, one was shot, obviously this one that you're seeing now is um, the stills element that went along with the live action. The nice thing is that when you have control to do both, you can light them the same, you can, the look and feel can be the same, there can be a continuity. A lot of the times, I'll do a, um, a, a, a stills job for a TV commercial. One always inevitably happens before the other. So then sometimes a disconnect between what the stills imagery looks like and what the live action does, or you'll shoot something um, like a, a pack shot like I did there, and then it just looks completely different when or you conceptualize it, you send it to another team and it looks very different. So fortunate um, in those situations to be able to control the whole process from start to finish. Um, here is another little um, food. This is the last video I'll show you, then we'll dive into the stills element. But this is a little video that I did um, featuring food with glass for, for console. Celebrate the glory of food and glass and win a delicious foodie night out for you and three friends with Zola. SMS the word glass to enter. The live feast with Zola is tastefully brought to you by Consol. Cool. So yeah, so guys, um, I can't see the, the chat, but um, Quentin said you'll keep an eye on it. So if there's any questions as we go, um, I want this to be as conversational as possible. So drop them into the, um, into the chat box and um, I will also post links to those videos um, later on if you guys are keen to have a look at them properly. I'm not too sure what the resolution is like coming up on your screen. So, um, so just to give you a bit, of, um, a bit of background on that, uh, Curtis, so the, the, the live stream to Facebook uh, you know, is okay. 
Um, but it's also being recorded and will be put up onto the YouTube channel where the much better. So um, for now, I think it's probably it's, it's probably fairly good, but um, the YouTube one will be better. Okay, brilliant. All right. So you guys can jump onto the YouTube channel after after this, and if you want to see those again or kind of come back to any parts of the presentations. But um, I think yeah, let's start on the on the uh, the food the food element. Um, so yeah, some of my images. I'm going to take you through a. Uh, let me let me first take you actually through here. Um, what I chatted about earlier was um, you know there's an element of of people and food. So. I, um, food being the journey. I've done work for Food and Home magazine. I've shot some cookbooks for Penguin Random House. This is Sarah Graham. She's quite a well-known uh, foodie in the scene. Um, I was fortunate enough, I don't know how this happened, but I got to work with Jan Hendrik, who is, if anyone knows Jan Hendrik, he's one of our first Mission Star chefs. Um, phenomenal person, phenomenal creative. Um, and um, yeah, luckily got to shoot him for Food and Home. So um, Another cookbook up that's just come out. Um, this is Nakia. It's a, a, a Indian cuisine um, cookbook. She's quite a big um, influencer in the, in the, in that kind of that, those kind of foods. She cooks phenomenal curry. She's a she's a fashionista, um, wonderful person. Um, these shots were actually they pretty much hide out more of Africa for her, her cookbook launch. It was, I've never seen so much of my work published anywhere, but on like parking booms and posters throughout the mall. So um, a really nice uh, person to look out for. Food's fantastic. But um, Curtis, just jump in. yes, I've got a question. I've got a question. Yes. So um, yeah. I, it, it came up yesterday. Um, and so I knew it was going to coming up again. Roshan is asking, how do you photograph uh, on glass or plastic bottle, for example, without having the, the flash reflect on the subject? Are you going to get to that a little bit later? So under the lighting um, section, I'm going to touch on that. Perfect. And thanks. then um, right at the end, under lensing, there's another shot that I'm going to I'm going to take on. It's um, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll definitely touch on that. So um, in order, so my approach to food photography, I've broken it down into four four steps: um, background and props, lighting, camera, and then knowing and working with food. Claire touched on the knowing and working with food, food yesterday, and I think it's quite an important um, element to food photography. So um, in in terms of um, backgrounds and props. I think start right at the beginning. I think it's good to, to kind of start off by going, what am I looking to achieve here? Um, what, am, what scene, what look and feel do I, do I want to do I want to get? Um, you know, if I've got a dark background and I've got a light background and I know that the client would like something that's a bit more moody, obviously lending more towards the dark background, you know. You can light a light background to be a bit more moody, but my pet hate is when you get given something that's pitch black and the client goes, okay, this must be nice and bright, you know? It, it has its limitations. You can do it, um, but whether it would look as, as beautiful as, um, as it should is another, is another, another question. Um, surfaces, uh, what, what am I gonna use? What am I gonna shoot this, uh, this subject on? You know, what is the food? That's also a very important thing that, that, we're gonna, that we'll look at. Um, how can I incorporate color and texture? What props, plates, cutlery, crockery? What's relevant to the, to the food? Um, how are we gonna think in layers, you know? Claire touched on having a napkin in the shot yesterday to soften up shot, uh, the shot. Um, where can we add freshness, add color in terms of garnishings? And then finally, the, the last thing I like to do is think about once I've got, once I've worked myself my way through those, is how am I going to like this? To tie into the first question is what am I trying to achieve in the shot? So let me take you through um, just four shots quickly here. Four very, very different looking feels. Got another um, question, Curtis? Seeing sure. Things we're in a... a, 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 a a between slides moment. Um, sure. So from Andrew Tudor Morgan, um, so do you direct the action shots? Oh, sorry, so you direct the action shots, do you also shoot the video yourself too? Okay, so I don't physically touch the camera or um, that, that camera that we shot on, it's so complicated that you need a special technician um, uh, to kind of operate it. Uh, what I do is I conceptualize what the shots are going to be as a director. Um, I'll put together the, the storyboards, the mood boards, um, the music. Um, the, I'll speak to the guys that are going to help me do like special effects, like in that console um, shot where you've got the, 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 the liquid flying um, out of the glass, and then we reverse the shot for the, the liquid to come into the uh, glass. We had to build a compressor attachment, cut off the bottom of the glass, fill up the glass, shoot the liquid out at a thousand frames, and reverse it in post. So um, 
you, you're looking at the shot, you're going, okay, I like the way it's lit, I like the way it's styled, you're giving suggestions, you're working with your creative and your art directors to go, um, we're not always showing enough of what we need to be showing. Um, but a big part of what I do in terms of the directing is uh, conceptualizing what the food is going to look like, how it's going to look. Um, what are the, the transitions going to be? Where, how are we going to wipe? How are we going to, are we going to cut from one shot to the other to make a, depending on what the look and feel is of the video, um, how are we going to do this um, and, and brainstorm and conceptualize it? So, um, Andrew, I hope that answers your question um, from, from that perspective. Um, on my smaller, my smaller shoots, um, where I'm doing like maybe a little recipe video, crews are a lot smaller, maybe two, three people, some guy recording audio, um, I will, I'll probably end up lighting it. I'll get a guy who can help me operate the camera. Um, cause from a, to be honest, from a, a video perspective, um, I don't, I know some of the theory and stuff like that, but the, the guys out there that do it a lot better than what I do. Um, so we'll talk about teamwork later. I feel like you do need to build strong teams around knowing your limitations and, and, um, working towards that. So for example, those high speed, um, Shots, you're shooting at a thousand frames a second. You need a huge amount of light to expose an image when, when you're shooting at a thousand frames a second. So um, no, working with a DOP who understands that and can help you to create that um, is a lot quicker because you only have that console job where two days to shoot it. I think we had about 80 shots to do. Um, you needed a good team to be uh, well rehearsed and, um, and, and, and good to kind of deliver those results. So yeah, Andrew, I hope that answers your question. Um, cool. Back to the uh, the food. So four very different shots here. Um, I think I'll, I'll, I'm going to break them down in terms of my approach on the left hand side of, of the screen. Um, the first thing was the the shots on the left hand side. Uh, we shot that for Glenders in um, in Hyde Park. The I walked in there and you, you kind of see the surfaces. You see the the confectionery as you walk into the shop, and you kind of go, well, what look and feel would best suit this product? Um, and as I was walking through. Um, the marble surfaces popped. Uh, there was a lot of pinks and a lot of like delicate, like uh, kind of lady tones, if I can call it that. Very feminine, very delicate. Um, figure that natural light for that shot would have been something that's beautiful. Happened to be that there was a window with the most beautiful natural light coming through it. We'll touch on some natural lights a little bit later. And um, yeah, we we set it up. We shot it. Um, I always always envisioned it. Uh, point number two to be kind of a little bit brighter. Um, so I chose surfaces and, 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 ac and accents that would kind of reinforce that. So and it was a very light space. So we figured it does, doesn't make sense to shoot on a very dark, heavy tablecloth or dark, rustic wooden uh, surface because the food was very delicate. The food was very refined. Um, the, pic uh, the picture on the top right-hand side was for Orem Restaurant. Now, that was a very different approach. They were busy building that in the Leonardo. And um, when I went into the site visit, they were large amounts of uh, beautiful natural light coming through, like very hard light um, on, on the, the, the surfaces, on the backgrounds. And um, we weren't allowed to shoot in the restaurant yet because the, the site hadn't been signed off for health and safety. So we took the textures and the surfaces. So point number three, we took the colors, the textures, took everything that was relevant to the, um, to the space, pulled into studio and we, um, we recreated the look that I remembered seeing when I went and did the site visit. Um, um, on the right. So I used a combination of hard and soft light um, to really kind of punch and make you feel like if you had to consume that dish now in that restaurant at this very, once lockdown's lifted, obviously, um, that's kind of what you would see because of the, of the nature of the space that, that we looked at. Um, again, there's a lot of uh, gold in um, at, during that site visit. And so if you look at the props uh, on the right hand side, subtle cues, there's a little bit of uh, gold crockery. So to point number four, you know, keep keep your eye open in terms of what what is the complete story you're going to tell. How can you accentuate things, um, you know, using what what you have, and um, thinking in layers. I love the the shot on the top right that you you kind of see the floor past the the, the surface. Uh, for me, it adds a bit of depth. Top shots can be quite um, kind of two dimensional. Uh, they very much uh, they don't show much depth uh, unless you're featuring a chair or a table. Um, or an edge or a corner of a table. So there you kind of, you could add some nice layers and um, the little bowl that the spoons are in are kind, kind of lifted up a little bit just to create some height. You've got the shallowness of the, um, of the plate, but then you've got a, some, a little bit of height from the coffee cup. And then I intentionally push it off 
to the side of frame because I love the shadow that came through. So that was a, a decision. A lot of people go, well, you know, you could have brought the coffee in a bit more. It's got a lovely gold uh, crema, which will then tie into the gold story that you were trying to tell. But there were so many images in the series that, you know, you could tell that story in so many different ways. Um, and that's a lovely thing about food photography is there's, there's no right or wrong rules. You can, as long as at the end of the day, you're creating beautiful food imagery, you're, you're winning. Um, so I'm going to jump down to the image on the bottom right. Um, it's a cocktail which we shot for that exact same um, restaurant. There's a bar attached. The bar had a much different feeling. Um, had, had, it was a lot darker, um, vibrant reds and blues and hues and stuff like that. So we decided to, for that shot there, we we're like, so going back to our checklist on the left there, going, well, what did we want to achieve here? We wanted something dark. So we went and chose dark colors um, that lived within that space. Um, uh, we got two primary colors here. We got red and blue. There's a little bit of yellow hinting in the in the protea. So, uh, from a color perspective, you've got kind of a, a full spectrum of red, yellow, and blue, which are all primary colors. So the color balance in that image starts to feel quite nice. Um, yeah. So th those are the kind of. Uh, um, I know I'm going. I know I'm talking a lot here, but I hope you guys are kind of picking up how I'm, I'm placing those five concepts into um, each image as we as we go through it. Um, the lighting in that bar was a bit more moody, so softer light. Um, we'll touch on a bit later um, when we get to the hard light, soft light, um, to that question, because you can notice um, the reflection in the glass, there's no hard, very, there's no hard highlights. Um, it's all very soft. And that, a lot of that comes down to the type of light that we used, um, being a very soft light. Um, and in cases where you have to use a hard light, how do you mask those highlights to make them soft so you can combine the hard and the soft to make them look, um, look beautiful. So we've got a question um, here, uh, Curtis, from uh, oh. Andrew, Andrew Tudor Morgan. What focal lengths do you shoot on? And I mean, obviously you'll, you'll use different uh, focal lengths for different, um, uh, you know, for specific dishes, but you know, let's just take us through the, the ones that you use regularly. Sure. Um, so in my kit, I've got a 24 mil, 50 mil, 85 mil, and a 105 um, on my 35 mil kit. Um, obviously, that changes when you go into medium format. Um, but if I take you through these images on screen now, um, the one on the left was shot on a 50 mil. Um, you can kind of see if you look at the coffee cup on the bottom and the, and the little source on the left, there's a slight um, warp to them. You can see it's got a bit of, bit of, a, bit of a perspective. Um, I'm going to take you through lensing later, um, especially when it comes to deciding on what lens to use, because I think it's, it's something that's very underutilized in food photography and it plays such a big role in, in achieving um, the right results. Um, also because the roof was very low, I couldn't put on an 85 mil and get that high. So that was a reason for that. On the right hand side image, top right with the little tartlet, um, that was shot on a 85 mil because of um, we were in a big studio. I could, I love the, the compression that, that you get on, on longer lenses in terms of it, everything feels a bit tighter. Um, so I liked on a wider lens, the, um, the, the stuff on the peripheral would have probably been spaced out a little bit wider would have or felt a bit wider. Um, the, the shot bottom right is also an 85. Um, or the reason for that was we shot on a, on a glass mirror, um, and we didn't have much background. So I couldn't, I normally on cocktails love to go into like a 50 mil or a 24 mil and get really close in on the, um, on the drinks because it gives you a beautiful um, foreshortening, um, which we'll cover a little bit later. But the, the surface was just too, too small. So if I'd gone onto a 50 mil, we wouldn't have enough space to, um, to style the shot. So onto a longer lens just to kind of fit everything in um, for those. Um, when we look at this shot here, this was, this was done on a 50 mil. Um, and what the beautiful thing about um, shooting on, on wider lenses and coming in closer to your subject is that you have whatever's closest to the lens will always appear a lot more heroic. So if you're shooting a hamburger, for example, and um, my standard hamburger lens, brief depending, but I will pull out a 50 mil 90% uh, of the time, just because I like to get close up into the burger. Um, I'll frame my burger first and then look at my scene later, because I feel like if you've got a beautiful wide angle lens up close on a burger um, it allows you to hero the filling it almost feels like it's going to fill in, fall into your lap um, and a little trick that that actually helps us with is that if you've got a a, um, a buddy bottle coke or a, a drink that you have to for an advertising shoot for example have to put in the background 
And what it will do is it will actually indirectly scale it for you. So a wider angle lens, because the burger is further forward to the lens, it will appear more heroic and bigger. Whatever's behind will actually become a bit smaller. Um, I've had instances where I'm shooting a full chicken and there's a Coke. Um, we've had to go into a wider lens to, and, and drop our angle slightly to push the Coke further back to make it feel uh, less overpowering. So yeah, this shot here was done on a 50 mil. Um, I'll, I'm gonna take you through the layering of the shot, but yeah, so the, the, the focal point is on the rice and then everything else um, falls intentionally on this shot um, because it was a shot for Tastic. Um, I wanted the rice to be sharp and everything else to kind of fall completely out of focus. Um, it's just so that your eye is focused on the rice. I like simple images. Um, I've struggled, I've toyed with this a lot. Um, a lot of people like a lot of sharpness throughout the images. Um, and I think each job, you have to take it as it comes, but I'm a huge fan of shooting wide open, shallow depth of field, very simple, beautiful, soft light. But let's, let's go through this. Um, so in terms of what we spoke about earlier, um, my thinking behind the dish was, it was an Asian um, inspired uh, dish. It's an Asian uh, styled uh, dish. This was a job that um, we, need a, we need a really good food stylist for because um, they had to come up with the recipes for this, um, for this shoot because the recipes were gonna then be attached to the image and then promoted online. So um, starting at the, at the top left-hand side, it's, it's kind of in your peripheral, but it's a, a little hint of um, kind of, it's an Asian Japanese newspaper. I'm not too sure if it's Chinese or Japanese, but it for me reinforces the, 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 the feel that we're going for. We're going for a, a um, oriental style uh, shot here. Um, we chose to do a dark option for this because this was the white rice. And we wanted to create the contrast between the, um, the rice and the, um, and the actual surface that the dish was going to live in. Um, but then it really needed a, um, I think a bit, a few more elements just to reinforce that Asian, those Asian cues that we were going for. So chopsticks obviously um, make, make a lot of sense. So, you know, a spoon wouldn't have done it or a knife and fork wouldn't have done it. So from a styling perspective, the stylist had a whole range of props for this shoot and we could go, okay, Let's push, the, um, let's push the Asian element, let's push the chopsticks. Um, and then the dark bowl of soy um, also reinforces the, the idea behind the shoot being an Asian inspired dish. Normally I would put a, a little highlight on the top of the soy because it looks like a big black hole. But to try not compete with the, with the rice in this, in this image, I figured that I actually did shoot it with a highlight and it just started to, to compete. So you, your eye would jump onto the food and then quickly bounce off to the soy sauce going. And you, there was this bit of a, a bit of a tension in the shot for me. So I decided to get rid of the highlight and just leave it, leave it black. Um, and then a lot of people don't notice it, but underneath the plate is a little bit of a napkin. Just because it's without it, it it's one of those things that without it, you feel like there's something missing. And the moment you put some, you put another layer in, it kind of goes, oh, well, this is actually starting to make sense to me now. That's um, amazing. Those, um, those layers, uh, you, you don't notice them until they're missing. It doesn't, it doesn't exactly. feel right. You know, but but that the, even, even though it's the same color, there's a little bit of texture. And it's just this subtle, you know, uh, lived in, I suppose, almost um, uh, type of feel. Completely. Um, and, and for me, it was something that developed over time. It wasn't something that happened uh, straight away for me. If I shot this shot maybe, um, say, when I started out, I would never have tried to introduce the little floor element on the right hand side of the frame. I probably would have brought in the newspaper and the rice on the top left, but it would have been a lot simpler. But as you, as you evolve as a person and as you kind of you go through, through, through imagery, and because I shoot predominantly food, your eye is starting, your eyes are kind of accustomed to to picking up the nuances and the differences in um, in, um, in in the frame, and you kind of go, okay, well, how can I make the shot different to the shot I did last time? Sorry, one more um, question there, um, yeah. Curtis. The what was your aperture on this uh, fifty mil? Um, so I was at it's I shot on the f one point four, but I think I shot it at about f two. Okay. Yeah, it, it looks it looks really really shallow, and I love that because it's it it, it picks out the uh, you know the rice and and the the little ingredients, but then the rest of it, which is there almost for show, is just there and it's subtle and it's uh, I love it. It just pulls it out so nicely. Yeah. Thanks, man. And and, and for me, what also helps is is the garnishing. Like you get the lines at the back, and you bring in a little bit of color, 
Um, and like you said, they, they really, they are blurry. So you, you, you know that they're, they're legible in terms of you know that they're lines, but they're not pin sharp. Um, this shot would have been completely ruined if the client had said, no, I want that brass bowl top left to also be sharp. Um, because then you would have had to have either opened up um, your aperture really wide, uh, so really small, so the other way around, and closed down your aperture to kind of get as much focus, or something that we do a lot nowadays um, in, in, in the food photography world is we actually focus stack. So we'll do, we'll, this, this is all locked off, lighting's locked off, this is all, um, this shot was shot on flash. Um, if it was natural light, you have to be a little bit quicker, but everything's on a tripod, you, um, you shoot, you push your focus, shoot, push focus, shoot, push focus, and you end up with um, a lot of different focus bands. And then there's a, there's a piece of software we call, that we use called Helicon, um, or Photoshop does it as well. And when you chuck in the player in, in those different plates and the computer will stitch together um, the shots. It's great for advertising, but um, I think that it's, yeah, in, in terms of this, it's not, um, it would have ruined the shot completely. I think let's let's move on to the um, onto the next one. I think we still have quite a bit to get through. I don't want to bore you guys with, uh, but a very similar shot. I'm going to just um, I'm just going to push through this one quickly onto the next one. So a very similar concept. This was a brown rice. Um, the rice was a little bit darker. We started to go with a little bit of a lighter scene. So again, a very soft light. The underplate has got a lot of texture. We went through a few different plate options to kind of go. Oh well, this works really well. Um, for me, the plate works well because the background has got uh, hardly any texture to it. It's got some patterning to it, which is, um, which is quite beautiful. Um, if the background or the surface that um, this dish was sitting on had a very heavy grainy texture to it, like a wood texture, I feel that uh, the underplate would have been too busy. So, um, and again, using a different floor. These are all shot um, in the food style, at the food stylist's house. So we kind of, um, we, this is a piece of board. This, is, this isn't even marble. She did a paint treatment to it. And because this was more of a Mexican uh, flair, you know, you've got the corn, you've got the coriander, it's a bit of a chicken, you've got your, um, your avo and stuff like that, which are beautiful, bright, vibrant colors. Um, if I look at, uh, again, a little napkin here, um, crockery supports the dish, you know, chopsticks here wouldn't have made sense. So let me, let me move on, because I think we still got quite a bit to, 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 to get through. Um, and here we'll touch on a little bit of highlights and reflections in bottles. So, I like to do a lot of my, uh, my work. Um, I like to build my sets. I, like to, I don't like to do much Photoshopping, purely because I'm not very, very good at it. Um, I'm busy working on that, uh, taking some lessons and some classes. But if you look at the shot on the right, that was a, a shot I did for Boston Breweries, which we, uh, we built up in, uh, in it, it, this was shot in a garage because we didn't have any budget for, for a studio. So you can see on the left-hand side, you can see um, the camera and the garage door in the background. Um, we used flowers, we actually physically styled the shot. And, and this was shot in a 50 mil, um, probably at about five, six or eight, uh, if eight, just because you wanted a bit, you don't want it to go too blurry because you still want to um, get some of the floral detailing in. Um, and this was a shoot that I conceptualized. Um, they literally just shipped me cases of beer and they said, just go wild, which is a, which is a really nice brief to have sometimes. And um, so being a wild blossom honey, uh, we found some blossoms and some some fainbos type uh, uh, flowers, and we um, yeah we we put the shot together. So um, a little bit of a behind the scenes here. I want to touch on uh, highlights again now. So this is a, a second shot from that series. Um, we this was rock hopper. Uh, we tried to build a bit of a bit of a scene in terms of making it feel like it's, it's a penguin sitting on the rocks. So we used moss. We used we used. Uh, uh, rocks, we painted some rocks, we colored some rocks. We then got like a bit of an oceanic type texture in the background. It's not perfect, it doesn't look like an ocean, but it's got the hues of an ocean. And I think it, it in the shot and in the coloration of the shot, I think it works quite well. And then um, we, we did the shot, had all this like kind of wetness on the moss and, and the rocks, and we kind of went, it's, it's missing something. So right at the end, I took a little spritz spot, a spritzy bottle, uh, like this little, um, you find them in the bathrooms that spray perfume. Go to Discam when, when lockdown lifts, buy yourself one of those. It is the most handy thing we'll ever use. You put some, some water in it. If you're shooting a salad, before you take the shot, spritz some water on the salad, it will, it will completely change what you do. And here, because I was shooting on, um, on lights that don't have a very uh, quick flash duration, um, you can see it's got streaks in the waters, which is actually what I wanted. It, it kind of, 
it mirrored that uh, a wave hitting uh, hitting some rocks and uh, flying onto the onto the rocks. So that was the the kind of thought and idea behind these shots. So in terms of the highlights on the left of the bottle, um, this shot was probably made up by I'm just trying to think now. Three there's probably about three lights on this image. Um, the key light, if you have a look on the left hand side, is uh, you can see the highlight on the left hand side of the bottle indicating the um, um, with the, the reflection indicates that the light source is kind of coming from a bit of a side angle here. Um, I use a few different methods. If that highlight gets a bit hard, um, often it means that the light source that you're using is a bit hard. Um, reflective, reflective foods, um, like a glaze on a chicken, will reflect your light source um, quite quickly and it's a very unforgiving. Bottles in particular are very unforgiving in terms of if you have a hard light source, it will have a very thin band and it'll be very bright. So a few different methods. Um, the first thing I ever discovered was um, I went to Herbert Evans and I was in the paper section and I found chasing paper. And I did the shot. Um, the hard, hard light, I, got the, I got the highlights as soft as I could physically with the, uh, with the soft boxes and that kind of stuff. Um, and then right at the end, I actually brought it into the shot. So you, you actually saw the shot, the piece of paper in the shot. I put the, um, the trace um, into the shot and shot a plate. And that gave me a beautiful highlight. Um, and then I just merged the two images in Photoshop. Um, I see there's a Photoshop thing happening either tomorrow or the next day. I'm sure when I talk about layers and, and, and overlaying and, and shooting multiple plates and, and layering them, um, it's something that is so easy to do as long as the camera doesn't move. Um, you literally just drop the two files into Photoshop, put one on top of the other, uh, create a, a layer mask, and um, you just brush through or brush away the stuff you don't want. Works perfectly. Um, again, there's just too much to cover, I think, in, in our time, but it's something we can talk about um, in future moving forward. It's very, very simple. Um, this highlight here was actually shot, um, I think I used two diffusions here. I used a piece of Perspex and I used a, I used a trace. Um, just, you got to play on the day. And then you'll see that there's a soft highlight on the right hand side of the bottle. And that is just a white card. Um, just normal A4, I think this one is about an A3. Um, brought it, you, you, you got you to feel it out. So I put the card in, initially the highlight on the right was too bright, moved the card away, softened, the highlight just uh, decreased in intensity. Um, and you got to play with these things. A lot of this journey is um, what you like. Um, some people look at the shot and go, I hate the spritz on the bottle. Um, doesn't bother me, absolutely. Like, I think it's fine. Um, there are jobs where the spritz is very important, but for me, I th the shot went a bit dead. So it went a bit black on the right hand side. So, because it's a dark bottle. So bringing a little gentle highlight there really did, um, I think, help. Curtis, quick cool. question. Um, sure. With the, the, the stuff that I've shot that's uh, that glasses or, or anything like that, um, I've I've used um, a bit of glycerine in the water, especially when, when those little droplets get a bit heavy and then they all clump together and, and, and run down. Do you use uh, glycerine in, in yours or do you prefer to just have that more natural, um, less sort of dotty uh, feel? So, uh, so, 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 so very good point. Uh, glycerine does help. So glycerine helps um, cling to the, the, the bottle. Um, these bottles are actually prepped with a, a matte lacquer. So what that does is the, the lacquer on the bottle holds the um, holds the, the the spritz, if you can call it that. Um, the spritzy bottle, I think it was a 50-50 a mix of water and glycerine. Um, why 50-50? It just worked on the day. I've had days where it hasn't worked, and you have to just have time to experiment and try with a, um, a, a bigger dilute dilation of water to glycerine and, and less of um, so what we did was we spritzed it and then I actually took a paintbrush and I tried to get a few runs. You'll see just above the label um, of the rock up on the left, there's some kind of runny drop droplets. They're not great, um, but I just dropped some glycerine on the bottle and let them run. Sometimes it works. And then I shot those uh, separately and I could bring them and drop them in. Fortunately, this shot here, um, I think it was maybe just two images. It was just a, a, a plate just to control the highlight. That was that was really it. I think all the all the droplets and stuff are natural as they are because to try comp in that mist and that spritz going over the bottle, I'm not good enough to do that yet. So um, I also don't like over photoshopping. Um, I like to create as much as I can in camera, and I think it's it's very important to create as much in camera as you can. Uh, I think it will definitely set you uh, set you apart. 
All right, so we could chat on those for days. So let's move on to um, what I feel is one of the most important elements of true photography, and that has to come down to the lighting. Um, I'm gonna take us through this little exercise I like to do. I've got two images on the screen. Uh, let you look at them and uh, we'll decide which one's natural, which one's artificial light. But just um, these are some points that, you know, go in the back of my mind uh, in terms of each job. Is it natural? Is it going to be lit naturally? Is it going to be um, kind of flashed? What, where's the direction of the light? Where's it coming from? Uh, the nature of the light. Is it going to be a hard light or a soft light? Um, these are all things that kind of influence the shot and change the look and feel of the shot. Um, a very important thing that a lot of people uh, forget about um, is the distance of the light to the subject. So a little example of this is that if you're shooting outside and it's, the sun is, there's no clouds, it's a hard light on the person, you have beautiful hard shadows, but the light on the person is quite, it's, it's, it's hard. If you had to pick up, and that's the exact same light, a match head, and then take your macro lens and focus on it, the, um, the light will appear a lot softer. You won't have as hard a um, shadow. There'll be a, a lot more gradation or gradation heard some people call it, um, uh, on the match head. And that's because the, the nature of the light source in relative to the subject is um, something that's very important. So if you've got a dish that is very small, um, and I, I'm gonna touch on a question from yesterday about shooting a macro with a, 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 just a normal window. And um, if, the, if the, the subject is very small and you've got a very big light source, sometimes the images could feel a bit flat because there's just so much light happening. Um, you could then go put a person in there and it's beautiful on your skin. So you've got to feel it out. You've got to go, okay, what kind of light am I looking for as a food photographer? And I think um, it's very important. I can tell certain photographers by the way they light um, because I know um, you kind of work out what they enjoy. And I think it's very evident in my work um, what type of light I like. So you can start to work out this is my picture, this is Curtis's picture as opposed to someone else's because of the type of light. Um, bouncing light. You know, light is a, it's a transverse wave. Um, it can be shaped, it can be bounced, it can be diffused. Um, I think one of the most valuable things any food photographer can, can do, go to Herbert Evans or any art supply shop, buy black cards, buy white cards and experiment. Um, if you've got the light source coming from the left and you have a white card on the right, you'll notice the fill. If, you have, if, you, if something, for example, is lit from the left and you wanna create a bit more shadow on, on the right, Chuck a card and see what happens. Sometimes light is bouncing off a wall that you're not even paying attention to, just on the other side of your subject. So it might be a full light indirectly that you're not, not, not aware of. Um, and especially when you're shooting with, nat with natural light, because you can see the light actually affecting the subject, you can play, you can play quite nicely with cards and, um, and darken things and lighten things. Um, I'm just gonna skim through these because I, we have quite a bit to get through still. So, and uh, natural light, uh, what was a game changer for me is uh, which direction does your window face? So a, a northwest facing window in the Northern Hemisphere is absolutely beautiful. And a southeast facing window in the Southern Hemisphere is, 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 is really, really beautiful. That's predominantly for soft light um, because you'll have windows facing in those directions tend to uh, not have light directly coming through, through the window. Um, you could spend hours just discussing um, lighting techniques and stuff like that. So uh, for natural light, but in a nutshell, um, the, wind, the, the light coming through the window is going to be bounced. It's going to be falling outside the window. Whatever's outside the window, you need to be mindful of because that's going to affect what comes through the window. So if you're shooting in a restaurant and there's a green patch of lawn outside, um, watch out for green costs, uh, especially on that, on, on like your cutlery, on your food, because you're going to spend time in post adding magenta or blue or whatever you need to do to get rid of the green cast that's happening. Um, in the Northern Hemisphere in winter, when it's snowing, it's white outside. The light coming through is clean, it's crisp, and you can set your white balance and color it beautifully. And then in terms of artificial light, um, one thing which I'm gonna cover on um, just a little, just briefly is flash duration. And that's what we talk about when we're shooting high speed food. Um, if you wanna freeze food uh, and not have to Photoshop it and, um, do those kind of things. So just quickly, two images. Uh, one was shot natural and one was shot uh, with flash. Um, uh, for me, I, I tried to choose images that were quite close, but um, on the right-hand side is an image that was shot with flash and on the left-hand side, an image that was shot with uh, natural light. Again, two very uh, similar images from like a lighting perspective, quite nice and moody. Um, 
the image on the right was shot with natural light, the image on the left was shot completely with flash. Um, there was actually a bit of ambient light. I was shooting in a, in a train here. So to the back right hand side, there was a window. Um, some of the natural light was coming through, but it was just a, it was one softbox outside, a meter by meter softbox uh, coming through the window, just combining the ambient light and the flashlight. And, and um, when you're shooting with, com with combining lights, the most important thing to remember is that your aperture predominantly will control your flash and your um, shutter speed will control your available light. Um, this was obviously there are exceptions to those rules, um, but if you if the flash coming through is very very hectic, maybe close down a little bit and um, see what that does. If you if you want to bring in some of the warm glows of any ambient light, slow down your shutter speed on a tripod, see what happens. Soft lights. So this this shot here, um, in terms of the um, the question about the, the hard highlights, this has got almost no 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 reflection there. It's just got a soft grade from left to right. Um, soft light has got um, a beautiful grade to it. It, um, it has better highlights on uh, shiny objects. And um, a soft light for me, and this, is, this is something that's very important. Often when people think soft light, they think moody lighting. Um, you can have soft light that is light and bright. You can have soft light that is moody. You can have hard light that is light and bright. You can have hard light that is moody. So it very much depends on um, the way you light it. Um, these will all be on the YouTube channel. I'm going to skip through these because there's quite a bit still, still to get through. So you guys can go back to this and have a look and read through the notes and the points. There's a, an example of soft light, a shot I did for KFC. Um, you can tell it's soft, soft light because the, sh the shadows are soft. Now there's no hard shadows. Um, the, the light is quite even, it wraps and it grays quite nicely. One of the most important things for me um, when it comes to lighting anything is the direction of the light. Uh, it, pays, it plays a very big um, role in the look and feel that you're going to get. There's no wrong and right. I backlit things, I frontlit lit the exact same things. Different look and feels, different applications, different jobs, um, different de desired outcomes. So the only thing about light that, that doesn't make sense to me is that when you've got a, a subject like this, uh, this wrap here that I did for KFC, and the shadows are going up into the frame. Um, for me, it's... This is viewed from the person sitting at a table looking down at the subject. There would never be light coming from the person's body onto the food. So I, it's just something that um, uh, I know not a lot of photographers like that way. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just a, it's a preference thing for me. I love light that comes from the top of the frame um, in these type of top shots and kind of gives you a beautiful looking feel. Um, and for me, the direction must make sense. So a very important thing um, in terms of lighting is that, and a photographer once told me this, and it's been the best bit of advice I've ever got, is that the light source must always make sense. So if you're lighting something, um, where is it being lit? Is it, is it in a room? Is it at a bar? Are there, is there, are there hard lights? So you must then incorporate hard lights. Is it just predominantly a window? Like this shot here, um, I shot uh, at Glenda's. There is a window on the right-hand side here. Um, it's, it, uh, there's a, a, a white card on the left-hand side. And the shot took me 10 seconds to do. The cake already looked this good. Threw some popcorn onto the surface. Um, and because this light was really soft, and what I chatted about earlier about the, the distance of the light source to the subject, um, I, I played a bit here. I moved the cake a little bit closer to the window, and I could see that the light wrapped around the cake a bit better. Moved it a little further away, and I noticed that the, 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 there was a bit more contrast in the grade on the, on the cake. So I felt it looked better with a bit more of a wrap. So yeah, that's what, that's what ended up happening. This is, um, so sorry, this was shot all natural. Exact same type of light Yeah, This is a burger that Claire styled for me. Um, I was just gonna say, I recognize that burger. <laughs> yeah, a simple, a simple, this was one light. Um, a softbox on the left-hand side. Um, it's a brioche bun, has some challenges. So you'll see the highlights in the bun. You'll see on the right-hand side, there's a slight reflection in the bun, a bit of a, a full card happening on the right-hand side. Um, and I've just noticed now that there's a bit of a bleed on the far edge of the back right hand side of the bun. You know, there was maybe some available light creeping in. Uh, you know, I think it's, it happened, these things, things kind of happen. So a very soft, simple light um, and it's dark and moody. So again, soft light is not dark, soft light is not, it's a type of light. It's not moody, it's not bright. It's how you, how you use it within the scenes that you have. Um, here's a shot I did for Aurum. Um, the whole building is, um, is uh, gauged around uh, Leonardo da Vinci. So these are some hand castings that we had done. 
And again, from that shot that I just I chatted about earlier, there was a lot of hard light in, in Orem restaurant. So again, we brought in the hard light um, to create this light. This light was literally just a reflector dish on a, on a flash. So it, it was lit with some soft, some side light, and then was too flat, um, put the reflector dish on the left-hand side, and um, yeah, back left-hand side, you'll see there's no light hitting the background, so it falls naturally into a, into a, into a darkness, which is quite nice because of the contrast between the foreground and the background. Um, and there's a bit of a, a card on the right-hand side. Um, but again, the card does not affect the dish. Um, I lifted the card up, so it kind of only filled the top of the dish um, of the drink. I didn't want to create a, I like the shadows happening on the right-hand side. And I didn't want to soften the shadows too much. Um, Here's an example of where I had to use a combination of hard and soft light. Um, but the most important thing to remember when using artificial light is that the direction of the light needs to make sense in terms of where is this light source coming from? Um, sometimes it gets a bit tricky if you're shooting with lots of different flashes and you've got multiple shadows. I feel like that's sometimes something that's a bit, a bit distracting. So here, the hard light, it's a, it's a soft box or um, a poly board even, that, or a white wall that you're gonna bounce the light off. That created the soft light, which gave us the, um, the detail in the, um, the risotto. Because with, um, without the soft light, what happened was with just the hard light on the subject, there was so much contrast that happened that the food became almost illegible. You couldn't make out what it was. Because, because of the, the nature of this food being very contrasty and lots of little pockets and holes for light to hide away in, um, it became a bit dark and, and crunched. So it was, this, it was almost as if someone went to Photoshop and just pushed the contrast slider all the way to the right. Um, it just it wasn't working. So a little bit of a soft light to combine the light, um, I think worked really well for me. Um, in terms of natural light, mixing natural light that's hard and natural light that's soft um, is something that um, very rarely happens. Um, but I have had it happen in situations where I've been shooting at a restaurant, um, beautiful soft natural light, and then someone will park his spare car outside. And then the sun hits off the windshield and comes through and it is the most beautiful light that just naturally occurred um, that, you know, you, don't, you can't control things like that. Well, you can try to. So eventually what I started to do was getting a little uh, a reflector and put a reflector outside and use the available light and then just popped in a bit of hard light to mimic the, the lighting because the car eventually left and I had to continue shooting. But I love that light so much that we had to try and make a plan. So it can also be done in... Um, in uh, Little, little tricks like that. Um, here is uh, something on flash duration. Um, I've got some other things which I think are more important uh, right now, so I'm going to skip ahead to that. But um, in essence, the, a flash has a certain output. And the analogy that I use is a torch. If you take your torch and um, you turn it on and off very quickly, it emits a very quick beam of light. And that light appears and disappears very quickly. If you turn on the torch for like a second and turn it off again, it's admitted a second a package, which is kind of a second's worth of light. So now if you've got something that's moving through, through your frame, um, as it's moving, if the light, if it's constantly being exposed, you're gonna get trails that happen. So using flashes that have got a very short flash duration are, are very important in terms of freezing that, um, that, uh, freezing that subject. So what happens is as that subject's traveling up, it kind of the, the, the light will come and expose it and then it's gone. The problem is that when you have lots of light, it kind of exposes, 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 and that's when you get the, the trails. But this is something that if there's an interest in, we can dive into this a lot more. Um, and you can see that these are, they're pin sharp. There's no Photoshop on this image. This is just being done very, very quickly. All right. Cameras, I'm not going to touch on camera settings too much because I think that um, this is something that you guys all have a good grip on. But one thing I will touch on is, for example, lensing. So this is what I chatted about earlier, uh, shooting on a wider angle lens. Um, this was a shot for KFC. It was a burger, uh, a 50 mil lens. I was probably about, I was just within the minimum focus range. Um, so as tight as that 50, 50 mil could, could get, I then kind of pulled the... Uh, the camera back just a little bit to make sure I could get focus. Um, and then um, you can you notice the highlight on the string because it's a little bit harder um, because I needed the, the harder light to kind of give us the crisp in this, 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 this batter. The one thing about hard light, which I didn't touch on now, um, hard light will show contrast and texture a lot better than soft light. Um, that's why it's, it's great when you've got a piece of 
anything that's crispy. If, you, if it's lit and it's feeling too soft, experiment, chuck a light, put a grid on it, and put a snoot on it, and just experiment with little pops of hard light onto your subject and see what kind of texture it starts to bring. A lot of these things have been, um, we've kind of learned as we've gone. Something's happened on set and we've gone, oh, you know, that's, that's quite nice. Um, and it worked. So here, a 50 more lens for me worked a lot better. Try, do a test at home. Set up a hamburger, very quick and cheap, um, easy to get. Shoot it on 100 mil and put a, 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 something behind it and you'll see the perspective. Shoot it on a 50 mil and come in closer and see what kind of results that you, that you get. Um, this Coke without that lens was massive. Um, you couldn't, yeah, it was really, really big. So we had to kind of, uh, we had to kind of cheat it that way uh, with lensing. And then very quickly, what Claire touched on yesterday, um, know, know your food, um, play with food. How long can fruit sit for? What kind of garnishings uh, will wilt? Um, coriander, anything fresh doesn't like it. Uh, freshness, don't let your food sit for too long. Um, certain foods, like there was a conversation yesterday in the group in the chat about um, cappuccino foam, 100%. Coffee, the milk starts to get big bubbles, it starts to look a bit murky and, and gross. Think about, about your plating. Um, pet hate, it sometimes works is when you've got a plate the size of a rubbish bin lid and you've got a piece of food the size of, a, of like a chappy on it. It, it, it doesn't make sense to me. Uh, unless you've got a chef that is plating a beautiful piece of something and he's got artwork in his sourcing around it and you're leaving him space to, to plate, it makes complete sense. But think about that a bit. Make sure that the, the plate here is the food as much as the food looks good in the plate. Angle, pizzas shoot better from above or higher, a higher angle. Um, burgers look better from, from a side angle. However, I've shot burgers Top shots look really good. Um, it's, there's a lot of there's a lot of patience, um, and um, there's some tip, tip, uh, tips and tricks that um, uh, Claire ch chatted on yesterday. But um, for me, a little spritzy bottle of water. Um, sometimes what really works well is a little oil, a little bit of oil and a paintbrush. Um, if, if a piece of meat is looking a bit dead, you know, just brush on a little bit of olive oil. See what happens. It will create highlights, but work with it. Brush some off, keep some on, and then. Working with, a, working with a food stylist, photography, food photography is a, is a team sport. And um, again, something that we could chat on for, for quite some time. But um, I think it's good to bounce ideas off each other. Um, you will find that you have a good chemistry with certain stylists. I work with Claire. She's got a really good um, new style. She's her fingers on the pulse. Her, her stuff looks really up to date and trendy. Other stylists I work with are, are better at, other, at jobs where they're a bit more old fashioned. Um, which I think Claire would probably shoot herself if she had to style something like that. But there is a market for certain things. Um, and I think that you need to, um, you know, you create a team and it's a, there's a good rapport that happens. So a little bit of um, carrying on with what Claire said. This is something that I did uh, two days ago. Um, I ordered some food. Um, I'll, this will be online so you guys can come back and see some of the suggestions, but look at Claire's presentation as well. Um, I ordered too much Parmesan. My wife almost killed me because it's, it's, the stuff is expensive. Um, quarantine, lockdown, but I decided to shoot it. Um, this is a shot that I shot on an 85 mm f1.4 lens. I shot it at f4, handheld, 180th of a second, ISO 100. This was literally in my dining room. I, I shot um, some cheese cameos just to, just to play a little bit. Also handheld. Except yeah, I went on to a hundred more lenses to try getting in quite close. And the run was beautiful, so I shot it. This is pretty much what I did. So excuse the look, I hadn't brushed my hair or anything. I was in lockdown mode. Um, arms on the table for stability. Um, my camera's got a little cool flip up display because to try to get your eye through the viewfinder at that angle is impossible. And um, this was shooting the detail on, on, the, on the right. And, um, Simple, no fancy lighting here. You'll see that the building outside is a bit orange. It's got this brick, so there's a warm light coming through. A little bit of color balancing in post, but nothing, nothing special. And um, yeah, guys, sorry, I've, I've really rushed to the end there, but I want to be uh, uh, mindful of your times. But um, I am creating a bit of an ebook um, at at this point in in time. So I'm going to put a little question thing on Instagram where you where I'll leave a space for you to um, in my highlights. You, uh, where you can put in any kind of question that you have, I can reply to it, and I'll even consider those questions for the book. 
um, that I'm doing. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, that's my handle. Have a look. Quinton, thank you so much for your time, man. Sorry, this has gone on for, for a little bit longer than expected, but um, lots to get through. And again, if there's any uh, part of this that you guys want to touch on further, let me know. Um, there's a lot that we can chat about um, in terms of all these things. Yeah, so thank you very much.